I'm Harry Glerkian, and this is Moneyball Medicine, the interview podcast where we meet researchers, entrepreneurs, and physicians who are using the power of data to improve patient health and make healthcare delivery more efficient. You can think of each episode as a new chapter in the never-ending audio version of my 2017 book, Moneyball Medicine, Thriving in the New Data-Driven Healthcare Market. Dr. Schneider, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. You know, it was funny because I was reading your background and I was like, wow, I mean, you know, so many different aspects of your background, both, you know, from a scientist and an entrepreneur from, you know, helping start, like I was going through the list of the companies that was longer than, than I remember. Like I know quite a few of them, but not all of them. And so I just thought like from a high level, like, how do you explain to someone what you do and why you do it? Okay. Well, we're all about big data. We, we like to use big data to understand things. And these days we want to use big data to transform health. And really that's what my career has kind of been built around. So <laughs> over the years, we've invented technologies for collecting big data and then we've implemented them. For a long time when I started out, it was really to try and understand biological systems. People used to study genes one at a time, for example, and proteins one at a time. We came up with a way uh, of studying them all at once. And that hadn't been done before. And then try and understand them in a systems context so that you weren't really just looking, You know, if you have a jigsaw puzzle, look at one or a few pieces of time. We wanted to see the whole puzzle at once as best we could. And so that's really been the philosophy. As I say, it was first used to study basic cell biological problems. And then I moved to Stanford now about 12 years ago. And the goal there really was to bring it to medicine, see if we can understand medicine, you know, at a holistic level, not just, you know, if you've got high sugar, you know, you're diabetic, sure, but are there other things going on as well, like other metabolic conditions? And, and that's really the philosophy. Let's look at the whole system, better understand what's going on and see if we can come up with solutions. And the other thing I think that's been a big stick of ours, and at least in the recent years, has been focused on keeping people healthy, extending the health span, uh, as opposed to just doing sick care, which is where medicine is today. So we really want to transform medicine. Yeah, it seems that, you know, um, health span has become the, the big shift. Um, and if you look at where we're going from a Affordable Care Act and everything, it's better to, it's more profitable actually to keep someone healthy than just treat them when they're sick. So I like that shift because it brings technology more into the forefront. Totally. Yeah, no, and, and it's going to require a lot of changes at a lot of levels. The, the whole payment level in the United States is, is broken. People often only get paid when sick people go in to see them, like hospitals. You only right. get paid to show up when you're ill. We don't put enough emphasis on keeping people healthy because people have said, well, you know, show me it saves money. Show me it doesn't. Well, until you run those studies, it's hard to do that. So I, I think the incentive systems are changing. That's slow, but it's also getting, um, you know, physicians and others used to this concept of bringing in big data to better understand people's health. And maybe to elaborate a little more on this, you know, if you walk into a doctor's office today, it looks pretty similar to the doctor's office of 40 years ago. You know, a few gadgets are updated, but otherwise same. And, and guess who the number one user of fax machines is in the U.S.? It's a healthcare uh, system. Yes. My, daughter, my daughters don't even know what a fax machine is. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. It's, it, it's true. Somebody did ask me the other day, like, can you fax it to me? I'm like, I think my scanner might, but I don't think I've got a, a jack that I can actually plug it into to, to actually send it because I don't do that anymore. Nobody does it except for the medical system pretty much, yeah. So, you know, You've had you you mentioned it. You had a hand in in you know developing these foundational ideas and technologies in functional genomics, such as you know high throughput protein sequences techniques, and you know known as RNA seq, and then making transcriptomics possible. Like, can you talk about what it's been like to sort of you know develop those technologies and then you know be at the forefront of trying to answer these big molecular biology questions and and what in your mind, what came first? Was it 
I got to answer this molecular biology question, or I'm, I'm actually, I'm going to develop this instrument and then be able to answer that question. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's a little both, to be honest. Often we develop technologies out of need or out of observations we have. So, so for example, in RNA-seq, we were trying to map where all the transcribed regions were, where all the genes were in, in yeast, which was the organism we were studying at the time. And we tried this one now very outdated method that just worked miserably. And we just stepped back a minute and said, there's got to be a better way. And so that's how we came up with it. We thought about it, came up with this way and, and then implemented it uh, and, and showed it worked. And then of course, if it works, it takes off quickly, very much like CRISPR. And that's been true for other things. In some cases, we'll make an observation, like when we first uh, invented a way to map the targets of, of key regulatory proteins called transcription factors, there we saw that these things were, were giving these dots in, in what's called the nucleus of the cell. And we said, well, where are those dots located? And so we came up with a method for figuring out where all the where all the binding sites were for these key regulatory proteins. So it's it's been a variety of ways. And then when it's come to medicine, we once we invent the technology, we said, well, people will say, well, well, how can we use these now in other ways that would be beneficial? And I'm not sure what you know, but as at Yale for a long time and I had a great time in this fantastic place, but as more on the main campus and it was just harder to implement them into medicine. And then about 12 years ago, I moved to Stanford and I'm right in the heart of the medical school where there's all these clinicians and very eager beavers around to try to figure out how to better, you know, do medicine these days. And so it's just been easier as we've implemented technologies to, to roll them out and see how they might work in the clinic. And, and so I think one of the biggest projects we launched when I came to Stanford was this, we call it personal omics profiling. The idea you collect a lot of deep data around the person and you do it longitudinally. So we'll, we'll sequence their genome. We'll look at all the molecules we can in their blood and urine, meaning their RNA and their proteins and their metabolites. And we, we do deep questionnaires and, and clinical tests on people. And then, and then, yeah, about eight years ago, we started on wearables back when they were just fitness trackers, realizing they would be powerful. So the idea was to collect data on people while they're healthy, by the way, not while they were sick, yes. while they were healthy and do it longitudinally, do it every three months and see how they change. And if they got ill, then we collected more samples. That was the idea. And that's turned out to be a really flagship project, I think, for just how we might better implement health. And, and you raise the issue about starting companies. So a little of my philosophy is I think academics are great at discovery. They're great at proof of principle, but they're not good at scaling. They think they are, but they're not. And this is what companies are just fantastic about. So we've spun off, we, we think some, what I hope will be powerful companies. One was a DNA sequencing company called Personalis. Yep. They've done very, very well. Then we spun off QBio, which is doing sort of a, a, a you know, a more commercial version of, of this personomics profiling I mentioned, but they added on whole body MRI and have some other things that are pretty powerful. So they've, they've got a medical version, a more actionable, a, a actionable version. Again, our academic lab is doing the research version, trying to figure this out, but the company can do implement it. And then we have another company, January AI, that's doing continuous glucose monitoring for trying to better control diabetes. So again, we figured out some things in the lab and then it made sense to commercialize it. So, so it all goes kind of hand in hand. To me, it all makes sense. It's, and it's very satisfying, by the way, to do stuff in the lab that, that we think is impactful and then try and get it out there to a broader group. We think that's how you scale. I don't think academics are capable of scaling, certainly not very well, whereas companies are. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, quite some time ago being a product manager. I mean, you 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 had to, like your biggest accomplishment was getting that thing from the bench right out into some, somebody in the field. And it's oh not my God, easy, it actually, it? yeah, it did something, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and that was the exciting part. Like stopping at the research, I would have been like, uh, that's it? Like all <laughs> I got was, all I got was a paper out of it? Like, yeah. no, no, I wanna, you know, I know yeah. that that's always the beginning, yeah, we get excited about the papers, absolutely. But we're very also, it's just fun to see it get out further totally. And and again, so that's all, literally all the companies, uh, maybe with one exception, have spun off of things we were doing in the lab, said, all right, we get it. Now it's time to scale this out and develop it in something people would be interested in. And it is very satisfying, as you say. So, so now, you know, I mean, 
the genome has come down in cost. I mean, a lot of other analytic technologies have come down in cost. I mean, I know the latest thing that Illumina has said is they want to get the genome down to like sixty dollars, right? For uh, the uh, to do the functional work, not necessarily the analytics or a analyzing part of it. But how do you see that changing? What you're doing and the impact. I mean, you've got a lot of data, so I feel like you can almost paint a picture of the evolution of a person uh, if if you could sort of see the initial traces. How do you see this playing a role in what you're doing and the impact that it's going to have on where it's going next? Yeah, well, I think getting the cost down is a big deal because when we set this up as research, it was very, very expensive. And so um, getting it out there will help, especially when you're talking about keeping people healthy. Uh, because people don't want to dump a lot of money into a healthy person because they don't know that here's a problem with their healthcare system. Most people will shift every 18 months. That's the average time people stay with their provider and then they'll shift to a new one. And that may be because their company shifted, not necessarily they did, but their company may have done it. And sometimes they change their job, they shift. So um, that's why uh, it, it's a barrier then for, for providers, healthcare providers to put a lot of money into you when 18 months later, you're gonna be with somebody else. But if the costs are pretty cheap, like a genome sequence is set, let's say with the interpretation is 200 bucks, it's worth it to you because then it's a lot easier to execute preventative medicine, get your genome sequence, predict what you're at risk for, and then and with a, a fairly low cost. But if they're gonna dump $2,000 and you're gonna be with somebody else, that there's a lot more balking, if you know what I mean. So yep. I, I think this is, so I think keeping the cost down is a big deal. QBio for their exam, they, they charge $3,500. And on one hand, that's a lot of money and we, we like people to do it two months and you get a whole body MRI and other things. On, on the other hand, we would argue for, it should save and it already has, we found like early prostate cancer, early ovarian cancer, early uh, um, pancreatic cancer, which is a big deal and some heart things and stuff like this. This is from the first hundred people that we did and it's more now. So, so we show it has utility. And of course, if you're one of those people, it's a big, big deal. So, and, but by getting the cost down, it just gets the whole barrier away. Right now you have to pay out of pocket because there is no reimbursement system. Right. For the, the cost gets down and I think people would reimburse because they'll be willing to run trials to show it does work and saves money. So I, I think the whole thing will go together, costs drop and we can expand this out and show utility. Well, and, and you know, if you think about the you know implementation of technology, like if you could carry it around on your iPhone when you go to your next physician and you've got it with you, right? It, that also brings a cost down rather than have to do everything all over again. Totally, yeah. In the future, and I think physicians are just warming up. To, here's an education side of this from the physicians. You know, when we first got involved in the wearable space, they would tell us how inaccurate it was, and they didn't like the idea that your iPhone would be so powerful. Um, more possibly more powerful than they are. Uh, uh, there was a threatening aspect of the whole thing. And, and I think they're now reassured that, first of all, <laughs> they're, they're very important. They're not going away. They're just going right. to use these technologies to augment what they're already doing. Uh, and and it's, there's an education side. I remember when genome sequencing first came out, even in a light place like Stanford, I would talk to some of my colleagues and they'd say, well, nobody shows that really worked. You know, <laughs> you know, and it's got a lot of errors. They just think about the negative, the instant reaction is, you know, uh, we don't really know how to do it. You might tell people something you're not gonna get, that's harmful and, and try to tell them, well, look, you have just educate people and educate the physicians. And now uh, when we first started actually, well, uh, you know, cancer even people are pushing back uh, and cancer is a no brainer. You need genetic tests or sequencing. But for healthy people, it was a strong pushback. Everybody's telling me, Mike, what you're doing is really harmful to people. You're going to get people, turn them into hypochondriacs when you sequence their, their DNA. And now there's some, some people feel that way, but most people have kind of warmed up, or at least maybe it's 50 50. <laughs> are receptive to the idea, well, yeah, maybe it is a good idea to get uh, to find these risks. From our standpoint, just from the first 70 people we sequenced our genomes, we found someone with BRCA mutation. Right. Another person had a mutation, suggests they might have certain kinds of cancer, they did a whole body MRI, they had early thyroid cancer. We caught that, had it removed, saved their thyroid, rest of their thyroid. 
you know, very, very useful. Another person, a very young person had a mutation of heart gene uh, and would have been at risk for cardiomyopathy. It turns out his father died young of a heart attack. And so he had this mutation. We saw this thing and sure enough, he had a heart defect, didn't even know it. He's on drugs now. So, so these technologies can be very, very useful, very, very powerful. And, but you have to show physicians that and then they sort of, oh yeah, now I get it. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We kind of get it. They may, they say, well, show us the evidence. And so that's what we're trying to do. Yeah. I mean, I just, I just, uh, you know, put in, I've got a book coming out in the fall and I, I just interviewed somebody who had done participated in BabySeq, uh, Robert oh, Greene's, right? Yeah, and great study. Identified an issue um, that had a profound effect actually on the decisions of the mother, mm -hmm. not the baby. Um, mm -hmm. And so it, it's, a, it's an interesting story when she went through it. I was like, wow, that is super impactful. Um, you know, it adds a lot of you know, she, it is funny. She said, you know, we did this and I was not expecting this, right? So it was an eye opener, but it's affected her decision-making going forward. Um, and it's along the lines of, of BRCA, um, you know, what she was informed of, but um, I'm sort of saving it for the book. So when it comes out okay. <laughs> in the fall, but, um, you know, you wrote a book back in 2016 that, you know, introduces non-experts to, personalized medicine. Um, you know, you covered everything from how DNA works to the applications in genomics and cancer. So I almost think like that might need a refresh or, or at least the publisher might want to put it out again, because I think people uh, yeah, are more yeah. interested now. <laughs> um, but if you were writing that book from scratch today, you know, five years later, um, would you write it at all? Would you, the field is, I feel like it's exploded in the last five years. Um, yeah. Yeah, on yeah. one hand, on the other hand, I still feel like I talk to people that still don't understand the impact of it. So I feel like I'm talking to both sides sometimes, but how do you think the field has changed in the last five years and where do you see it going next? Yeah, great question. So when we wrote the book, uh, it, uh, you know, people really didn't like this area. <laughs> they didn't like the sequencing genomes and things. They thought it was harmful. Uh, and, and the same idea, I mean, we literally collect millions of data points every time we sample someone, and people still bring it up. Uh, and so it was really the goal there was to educate the people about what the technologies are, what they're capable of, and this sort of thing. So I think we have come a long ways since then, where the field was mostly against, I asked people to raise their hand, how many of you want to get their genome sequence? Usually it's a small fraction, even an educated group. Now it's probably the majority, if they haven't even done it already, many have already done it. So uh, I think the world has changed. I think, so what I would do is update the, you know, the power of the new technologies. New technologies have come out even since we first put that book out. So I'd add more, expand the wearable space. I just think we can put a smartwatch on every person on the planet if we wanted to. Uh, a very inexpensive one that would be a health monitor for people. and. And there would be a no better time for that than this pandemic that's going on now, because we, we actually can show, we can tell when people are getting ill prior to uh, symptoms from a smartwatch, from a COVID infection, right. another infection. So we can talk about them more if you like, but it's a pretty cool study. We, we can show again, 70% of the time, we can tell when you're getting ill because your heart rate jumps up when you pick it up with smartwatch. So imagine putting that on everyone in the planet and just letting them know, look, we can tell when you're getting ill, you know, even if it's not perfect, a bunch of the time that we think would be very useful. They don't send their kids who are sick to school, affecting everyone, or it shows up in a nursing home and, you know, you flag it right away. And that would be, we think, very, very powerful. I view it as analogous to, you know, a, a car. You know, a car usually has several sensors. Some have as many as 400 sensors on them. And you can't imagine driving your car around without a dashboard, uh, right. or without a gas gauge or, a, you know, a speedometer or an engine light or all these things. On. We, we've gotten so used to that. This is what you do when you drive a car. Yeah, here we are as people, which are more important than cars, and we're all running around without any sensors on us, except for internal ones, which are okay, but they're kind of slow. And I just, to me, it's just totally logical. We should all have our own you know, sensors on us so that just like your health, that just like our car 
is our dashboard on our cars. It's, it's the car health dashboard. Our smartphone will be the health dashboard for humans. And just let us know how our health is doing. And it doesn't mean when you see a light go off that for sure it's something going on, but it gives you a heads up. And it has, you know, in, in some cases, our profiling has really had life-saving consequences. Yeah, and I, well, I mean, I, it's funny because I think about these things and I, I look at a lot of these technologies and, you know, it's always a single biomarker of some sort, right? That That's, you know, a heartbeat or temperature or something. And then I think, to my, well, the next level has got to be a combination of them, which makes the predictive power that much better. That's right. right. Yeah, we call that multivariate. Yeah, where you bring in several features. So you start seeing an enlarged something or a, a thing on an image, and then you see that those biomarkers up. This is how we discovered some with early lymphoma in our study. They had an enlarged spleen, and then we saw certain markers were up in their blood and said, something's not right here. Uh, and then they did follow up and sure enough, they had early lymphoma, no symptoms yet. So again, caught early, a lot easier to manage, right. uh, just much better off. We have a number of examples like that. So the combination tells you, and the other thing that's very underappreciated is the, lo the longitudinal profiling. Uh, people don't realize that if you go in and get tested now and they, they rarely look at your old measurements. And so they just see if you're in the normal range and you could be at the high end of the normal range, but you're still normal, all right, you're fine. Don't worry about it. But if you look at your trajectory, you know, maybe you've been riding kind of in, normally in the low normal range and suddenly this one jumped up, you know, 50%. You can still be in the normal range, 50%. And something's heading in the wrong direction and, and you would be ignored for that. Whereas if we just had very simple algorithms that can flag that sort of stuff, look, you're not only up in this market, but you're up in that one too, which is related. You know, maybe something's going on early. Let's see what's going on there a little better and catch things earlier. Again, when you can manage it better. So, so I think we've yeah. got to bring in longitudinal information. Again, to me, that's why the wearables are so powerful because they measure 24 seven. Well, I do that with my, my physician. I walk in and I'm like, okay, here's my data for the last, you know, X amount of time. And it's funny because even I've noticed like, during COVID, because I was much more sedentary, like certain things were going in the wrong direction. And I was like, mm -hmm. oh, no, 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 I got to get those those back in line. If I didn't have the ability to look at it over time, and I was only looking at that one point, you know, how am I going to see where context. it's going? Out of context, yeah. Here's another thing that's wrong with medicine today. It's all population-based. So they will make every decision about your health based on population averages and hence that normal range. But again, you may not at all be like normal population levels. And so you've been told, here's my favorite example. You've been told since day zero that your oral temperature when you put a thermometer in your mouth is 98.6. But it turns out, first of all, that number is wrong. The average temperature is 97.5. But more importantly, there's a spread. So the the, what's called the 25th quartile is 94.6. So four degrees below. And the 75th quartile is 99.1. So in today's world, if your normal baseline temperature is 94.6, that's your healthy temperature. You walk into a physician's office at 98.6. So tell you're healthy, everything's great. What are you doing? Go home. But you're at four degrees Fahrenheit over your baseline. I guarantee you are ill. Uh, this is just, it's not healthy. So you got to know your baseline. And for me, by the way, mine is 97.3 and it's been dropping a little bit over the last 10 years. So, uh, which is, there's some studies suggesting that is the case actually. So that people do drop a little bit as they get older. But the point is that, you know, my baseline is not 98.6. If I'm 98.6, I am ill. <laughs> Yeah, well, my mother always told me I was special, so I don't fit into the general population. <laughs> so that must be the case. Um, you know, just talking about the wearables, because I noticed like earlier, you had at least four devices and I think a, an aura ring or maybe. Well, I lost it recently, but yes, I normally wear I normally <laughs> wear eight of these devices, an aura ring and then four smart watches. <laughs> I have a continuous glucose monitor and environmental sensor. I've got all kinds of gadgets. Oh, Jesus. Okay. Well, so <laughs> tell us where you see the overlap of these digital devices and the personalized medicine sort of coming together because I feel like one is 
much earlier warning system or could be an earlier warning system of what may come in the future. And one is a current monitoring system of yeah, how the machine is working. Yeah, I mean, I do think they're an integral part of personalized medicine. Uh, they're, they're only now, I think people are realizing the power. The pandemic, I hate to say it, helped with that because remote monitoring has now become popular in the concept that you can start managing people. When we So a little background there, we started on this about eight years ago when the Fitbit was out there and people were using his fitness trackers. We thought, well, gosh, these are pretty powerful health monitors because they're measuring your heart rate and they measure 24 seven. In fact, uh, you know, the first device we use doesn't exist anymore. Base watch, it takes 250,000 measurements a day. Now, some of them will take 2.5 million measurements. Yeah. They really follow you deeply and they'll measure heart rate, heart rate variability, skin temperature. Those can all be pretty accurate, by the way. It depends on the device. Some, some will measure blood oxygen, even blood pressure. Those are less accurate, but their deltas are pretty good, meaning the changes. And then there's other things out there too, something called galvanic stress response. So they're, they're, they can measure all kinds of things. They're always following you. So we think that's super powerful. Uh, now, when we first started, again, physicians pushed back and said, well, you know, everybody knows they're not accurate. And we actually will have a paper coming out very soon saying, well, actually, they're more accurate for some measurements like heart rate than what you measure in a physician's office. My heartbeat can vary by as much as 40 beats per minute, uh, depending whether I drove there, biked there, even if I rested 15 minutes, it's still different and whatever is going on in my life. And But if I pull my resting heart rate off in the morning first thing, it's pretty constant unless I'm either stressed or ill. So right. you actually get better measurements from some, for certain kinds of measurements from these devices. So that's the first thing you have to show, show them they are accurate and things. So we think we've done that uh, in some cases for some kinds of things. So I think we now just need to get physicians to start thinking about that more and get them as an integral part of your healthcare that when they show up, they don't have to take your you know, heart rate anymore, they'll just read it from, it'll already be pumped into the system. You can already have it shared and they can follow your trajectory since the last time they saw it, last whatever month, six months, two years, what have you, and see what's going on much, much better than these static measurements that they take every few years when you're healthy. So I just think they're gonna be super powerful for following your healthy physiology. And in, when you get ill, it's, it's all about the delta, the shift from your personal baseline. And what's powerful is because we all have different baselines, different heart rate, different blood oxygen, just what have you. When you shift up, you can figure it out. And, and the, the way we got in this the most was from our first work, we actually showed, uh, I actually figured out my Lyme disease. I picked it up from my smartwatch and a, something called a pulse ox, a blood oxygen. Yep. And it was because my, my heart rate went up. I was flying to Norway of all things. And my heart rate went up much higher than normal. And my blood oxygen dropped much lower than normal. And it, I saw it on the airplane and it didn't return to normal after I landed. And I knew something wasn't right. I thought it was Lyme disease because two weeks earlier, I was in a Lyme infested area, uh, helping my brother put up fences and where most ticks are Lyme infested was in Massachusetts. And then I saw this and I, I warned a the doctor there, it might be, it's a classic case. I warned him it might be Lyme because of the timing. And I later got, by the way, I didn't have symptoms. That was the key. I sold these things off before symptoms. I later got symptoms, went to a doctor in Norway. He pulled blood, said, yep, my immune cells are up. I've got a bacterial infection. And he wanted me to take penicillin. I said, no, I should take doxycycline. The classic case of, you know, you have to take charge of your own health. He pushed back, but he did give in in the end. Uh, uh, and, and it turns out it cleared it up. I took it for two weeks. And when I got back, I got measured. Sure enough, I was Lyme positive by a sera test. And I given blood right before I left. I was negative. So I sera converted. Very well controlled experiment. <laughs> uh, and the point out of all this is that I could figure out my Lyme disease from a simple smartwatch and a pulse ox. And so that showed the power of these smartwatches for doing this sort of thing. And then that's how we got, we looked into data and saw every time I got ill from respiratory viral infection, including asymptomatic time, I could see the jump up in heart rate. So we, we knew it would work for infectious disease. And then when the COVID pandemic came, as you might imagine, we just ramped up and really scaled out that study. And yeah, that's who did what you do, done. Who, who, what did you use or who did you do it with? Yeah, so we're, we are device agnostic. So we, we rolled out the study in a two-part manner. So meaning, 
we first wanted to show the, uh, our algorithms and, and perfect algorithms for detecting COVID-19. So we partnered with Fitbit, uh, but also talked to other groups as well, pulled in data. We started with Fitbit. We could, right away, we got 32 people who had been COVID infected with their Fitbit watch still running. Some people, <laughs> they <laughs> let them burn out. Uh, but we, we, and we had a diagnosis date and a symptom date. And so we could actually show, we initially showed that for 26 to 32, we could see a jump up in resting heart rate from a simple smartwatch, uh, in this case, the Fitbit. Uh, and we had several different algorithms, smart, both steps and, and a resting heart rate were val val uh, sorry, valuable for seeing this. Uh, we, we showed the algorithms work and then we built what we called a real-time alerting algorithm. Actually two of them, we tested them out and they, they seemed to work. So then in December, and we'd love all you listening to this to roll in our study, innovations.wearable.edu, sorry, innovations.stanford.edu slash wearables. So innovations.stanford.edu slash wearables. Uh, anyway, what we did in December showed we rolled out a real-time alerting system that will actually send off a red alert when your heart rate jumps up. It works about uh, 73 percent of the time we have 60 people have gotten ill, a little over 60 and we can see this red alert will go out before at the time of symptoms in 73 percent of cases and we even now caught two asymptomatic cases where their heart rate went up their alert went off yet they had no symptoms but they happened to get tested and they were positive so we can show that this thing really does work uh, and so now we're trying, as I say, we are building an infrastructure to roll this out for millions and millions of people. So we That's want- That's good to... because I was just thinking, it would be great if these things would proactively ping you and tell you there's a problem rather than you have to look at them all the time and see where you are compared to baseline. Yeah, the one minus is you have to open your app and sync it. And we're trying to do exactly what you just said, set it up so you don't even have to open the app. You probably have to leave it open, but we want to be able to ping you. Uh, we have to get an IRB approval. That's our review board approval. But we want to do exactly what you just said. So right now, you just have to check it every day. You open your app and you just see, oh, do I have an alert or not? When you wake up, do it first thing in the morning. And if you have an alert, you know, we're, we're not allowed to give a medical recommendation because that's the way our study goes, but we can say, look, you have a jump up a resting heart rate and I'll let you figure out how to interpret it. But ultimately the plan would be to say, you know, gosh, maybe you don't want to go to that party tonight or go to work and maybe you want to go get tested for that something could be up. That's ultimately where we want to get to with this alerting system. So, and I don't think we'll be too far away. We're, it, we're, we're showing it where we're going to pull in more kinds of data so we can get that 73% up to, you know, 95%. That's our goal. Yeah, I, and it's interesting because I was talking to, I, just the other night, a, a friend of mine who's a, a you know primary care physician, and she was saying, well, you know, these things are not very accurate and, you know, people are going to come in for problems and, you know, these algorithms, I'm like, okay, hold on. They're, they're actually pretty accurate. They take a lot of data over a long period of time. So, you know, those blips, I can sort of, you know, wipe them out if it's a totally. truly a blip and I can see a lot of information and it's more accurate than me coming in that one time where you see totally. me. But the other thing I said to her was, you know, you realize like this is just gonna get better. Like the more and more data we have, the better and better these things get. And at some point it is going to be like, the standard of how things are done. And it's, I think it's difficult for people to understand that uh, more data, better algorithms, you know, better equipment, all of them coming together, you just end up at a place where you, you're gonna, this is gonna be the standard. 100% agree, a good case is, can you imagine if we told people you can't own a thermometer? They're medical devices, nobody should have a thermometer. <laughs> that means not, you know, nobody would be taking their kid's temperature. By the way, the thermometer is a terrible way to tell if you're getting ill. It's an okay way, I should say. It should be your resting heart rate is way better. We can show that. That it's kind of funny. A thermometer is a 300-year-old technology, yeah. very ingrained into our medical system, and it, um, it has some value. Don't get me wrong, but it's not as good as any of these other technologies we can pull off a smartwatch, like resting heart rate and other signals, and soon respiration rate, all that stuff you can pull off. 
And you have a much better signal for when you're getting ill than a simple stick of thermometer in your mouth. And it's going to go yeah, way beyond infectious disease. I, I want to thing we can show, we can get a signal for something called hemocrit and hemoglobin from a mm -hmm. smartwatch. And we can, and that actually can be an early sign that following those levels can give you a clue as to whether you're getting anemia. We have another signal coming from a smart watch about diabetes, something called insulin resistance associated yep. with diabetes. So we can get, they're not clinically diagnostic tests. So they, they, and they're just, they're kind of hints, if you know what I mean, but they're valuable hints. We think, well, you see this, if you see this change, maybe you should go to a physician and follow up on this. And there's some measurements from a wearable that there isn't even a clinical correlate for. There's something called galvanic stress response, yep. which is conducted on your skin that, you know, there is no medical, typical medical correlate for that, yet that's a valuable measure. If you're stressed, you will sweat more. If you're diabetes, you'll have drier skin. It will give you a signal towards diabetes. So these measurements we think are going to be very, very powerful. No one measurement comes back to what you're saying earlier. Multiple measurements together will help give you a better idea of what's going on that includes that something may be up that alerts you while you're still in this, you know, fairly healthy state, we hope, and can then take the right course, the right intervention course. You almost wish there was a spider graph, right? That had your normal and then showed deviation from normal on these multivariants so you could evaluate it over time. I mean, I find myself having to go, I have to go to that one, then I have to go to that one, then I have to go to that one. And it would be a whole lot easier if it was in one format or one graph that could show me where things are. Um, Hundred percent for resting heart rate. Like I have to remind myself when I'm getting up in the morning, I'm like, don't move, push the button first, right? So that I get an accurate resting heart rate. Because I'll stretch, and the minute I stretch really hard, right, your your heartbeat changes. And so you mess up the measurement from where you want it to be. Yeah, well, a lot of people don't, when they stress, they don't stretch, they don't breathe, and that will also increase your heart rate. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Yeah. So let me but ask by you By the way, I think you... those integrated systems will happen, and your car dashboard is a good example. Right, they, those aren't, aren't usually single or single sensors that are triggering. Some sometimes they're integrating multiple sensors to to set up a, a, a signal, and that'll be true for your health. And and just the way the data is organized, again, in our antiquated healthcare system, it comes back as these individual measurements. Whereas instead, you want this to say, well, here's your cardiovascular panel, you know, with these five measurements all together, and these other panels around systems to tell you, and even some broader panels besides that, so that you can see things in this more holistic fashion. Another analogy might be, you know, when a pathologist reads images, they write up a report, which they give to your physician. Your physician can't read a uh, an image slide to tell if you have cancer or not, but they can read the report the pathologist get. And so I think that's how we need to integrate these data to put it in a usable fashion. To be honest, not just for the physician, but for the consumer, because they're the ones who can act on it most quickly. They're the ones who are going to have the most time to think about the information. Again, another flaw, and it's, it's no negativity to the physician it, it, it meant, but they only have 15 minutes to spend with you, at least in the U.S. You, you, know, you get a half-hour appointment. The physician's only there 15 minutes. They glance at your chart. They do a few things. They make a quick assessment, and they're off to the next patient. They have to write it up manually, ironically. Uh, and then, uh, you know, you have a lot more time to spend thinking about what's going on. So if you have this information accessible to you, something doesn't look right, I think it's a better chance for you to take control. It's like me and my Lyme disease. Uh, you know, if I wasn't watching what was going on, I don't know what would have happened. Uh, um, it was very valuable for me to have that information. Oh, no, I mean, I, you know, it's funny because I was, you know, we're using these machines all the time and I'm, you know, I'm, I try to be as deep in the space as I can be, but if there was an algorithm or a series of algorithms looking at, you know, different data streams that are coming off of me and can sort of be like, um, my friend, right? Whether it's weight or heartbeat or blood ox or something else that could sort of highlight it for me and then put it into a format that is easy for me to digest either yeah. graphically or or a few words it's, i mean it would be a lot easier for me to manage myself 
Yeah, it's coming. I, I think it will hit, but you're you're right. I mean, again, medi medicine's conserved. You, if you do belong to, you know, Fitbit, there are certain programs or Apple, they'll they'll ping you, you know, here was your weight this week. Your weight. Right. <laughs> you get these, but we're just at the trivial stage of what can come, obviously. I think what you're saying where you would integrate different data types and then see these and Again, in this paper we'll have coming out soon, we show that you can actually follow people's trajectories, set up AI systems, uh, artificial yep. intelligence systems, uh, follow people's trajectories and look for these deviations. Uh, uh, it's still very, very at the early stages. I think they're gonna be super powerful for managing chronic diseases like diabetes, obesity. Uh, to be honest, there's something called chronic fatigue syndrome. Right. that a lot of folks have and they have crash days and good get days and to be able to tell all well, these things are associated with your crash days watch out for those try and avoid those these are your good days do more of those it's very very true in the glucose monitoring space diabetes people don't realize it's an exit endemic if you don't realize it nine percent of the u.s population is diabetic 33 percent are pre-diabetic and 70 percent of those are going to become diabetic by 2050 like they estimated half the population could be diabetic if we keep going the way we're going so uh we need new intervention plans while people are healthy don't wait till they're already diabetic and have problems well, and this is where the continuous glucose monitoring technology i think is going to be really powerful figure out what spikes you it's very personalized what spikes you is different from what spikes me right and to be able to see that, I don't know if you've ever worn one, but they're just very, very powerful. And so it's, again, one reason why we formed a company called January AI to help help with that. Well, it's funny because my wife was asking me, she goes, you know, I wanna, I, I'm thinking I want to wear one of these so that I can see what I eat, sort of how it affects me. But it's all by physician prescription. Right? Yeah, and, and you're, so, up, you know, yeah. go and convince your physician, you know, hey, by the way, I need a script for this. Yeah. So uh, two comments there. One is in Europe, there is no prescription. You can get it over the counter. So, so there's less regulation. So they're ahead of us on that. I think it'll happen in the U.S. Right now, you do need a uh, um, physician, but there are studies or groups rolling out. So again, I met, happen to mention ours. So there's some others as well. But with January AI, you can actually get this. You get a, that their case, they take it even further. You get this continuous glucose monitor for for 28 days, you can do the program longer, but you can, it not only shows you what spikes you, but they also train you a little bit, meaning uh, you eat, you know, your favorite food or it could be rice, what have you. Rice, by the way, spikes almost everybody. And then you, you, and then the next day you do the same thing, you do it for breakfast, you do the same thing, and then you take a 15 minute walk. And it shows how it suppresses your spike. So it's a, it's a behavior intervention program as well. Uh, so it teaches you, and we think that's kind of powerful as well. We, it, it, you don't, you not only want to get the data in and have people learn from it, and, uh, and this thing does food recommendations as well. Uh, you, you want to be able to teach people how to live better, healthier lives as well. Do an intervention, as they say. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that you know, some seeing it so that the data convinces me, and then understanding what I need to do to fix it is also very useful, right? Um, 100% agree. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So do you think we're ever going to get to, you know, what I want to, I, I know that we have data-driven healthcare. Everybody always, you know, likes to say we are data-driven, but I mean, truly, like, I don't make decisions on businesses without really understanding their profit and loss, where their costs are, what they're spent. I mean, very detailed analysis. I, I, do you think that we're going to get to this point of beyond hunch driven medical decision making, like beyond what was that show? Um, oh, my God, where the doctor would sort of put all these pieces together and then come out with a uh, I, famous actor. I forgot the name was of it. House, but, house, or house. House. Yes. Yes. House. <laughs> okay. That was it. I mean, do you think we're going to get to more data driven? Because I feel like. I feel like we should be there already. Yeah, in some I mean, ways. Again, uh, so a, you know, I'm very Pollyannish. So I, I believe the answer is going to be yes. Uh, I'm like you. I feel like we should be a lot further along, and I just think that's the conservative nature of medicine. People think you know do no harm, and so they do nothing. And I would argue doing nothing is harmful. Uh, so I do think we need to get these, uh, the you know, this data integrated better. 
I think the best way is to roll out studies like the ones we're doing and others that can show it has power, has impact. And that's how you convince people. I, I'd love to come up with a way to accelerate it. I think programs like this are a really great way to do it. A lot of the stuff is going to be consumer driven. I mean, people are now wearing smartwatches, just not just not just for fitness tracking, but for health devices, which is itself now a new concept. So it's coming. And luckily, they're fairly inexpensive. I think that's the, the way to happen. You know, when a lot of new technologies roll out, they are pretty expensive. And then only the wealthy can have access to it. But the hope is that as the wealthy uses these and shows it has utility, then the price drops and they get out to everyone. Certainly, that's how genome sequencing started. And I think it'll be true for a lot of these other technologies. Luckily, smartwatches are pretty cheap to begin with. So even a $100 smartwatch is a pretty powerful health device, I would argue. I think the- Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, if, if Illumina achieves its $60, right, for the function, I'm, I've been looking at this uh, uh, anal analytics approach that will bring down whole genome sequencing to $60. So if it's $60 to do the, the, the actual work, the wet chemistry, and then $60 to do the analysis, it's, I, <laughs> I don't think there's many barriers in the way anymore. Yeah, totally. And, and we're not so far away where people will, so they'll get their genome sequence, but now there are technologies to look for early cancer by sequencing DNA and blood. And, you know, there's yes. a billion dollar- Liquid company. biopsy, yep. yeah. Yeah, liquid biopsy. So. Grail and Garden are, are leaders there. My company, Personal House, is, I like, think, uh, doing all right. So um, anyway, that's a, uh, um, those are areas that we think are going to be powerful. And soon they'll become routine tests once you show utility. But no company pays for it right now until you show that, right. gee, you do this on healthy people and it doesn't cost the, the company $5 billion to find three cases, which it won't. Uh, yeah, that, then it'll roll out. So right now, the, and the way this works too, for the liquid biopsies, it, it's looked for, they, they use for cancer recurrence. So right. if you had cancer, you try and see if it'll appear again. Uh, and that's very logical and they'll, they'll demonstrate utility there. They already are. And then soon it'll be early detection and that'll go to the high risk families. It always comes down to who pays and insurers right, right. won't pay unless you're at high risk generally. And then soon, if it's cheap enough, comes back to your point, if it's cheap enough, it'll be there for everybody. Yeah, I, I have this vision that you're gonna go into your CVS or your Walgreens and you, you know, once a year or whatever, and we're gonna see things so early that I'm hoping one day in my lifetime that people will be like, cancer, what, 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 what happened, like you were able to get so far ahead of it that it stops becoming an issue. Yeah, um, what do you mean you detected cancer only when you saw this giant lump? What's that all about? <laughs> yes, exactly. We should, we should exactly. be way ahead of that. Yeah, I'm 100% with you. Yeah. So let's say we, we start, I mean, implementing this at a much larger scale than and broader than what we have now, because I think you and I are probably way ahead of <laughs> a lot of other things. But do you see that affecting a longer life or do you see it like I'm trying to weigh health span and lifespan, right? No, it's all about um, health span, yeah. It's all about health span. You want to extend a healthy life. Uh, you don't want people hanging on in a miserable fashion for years, I think. Anyway, that's, that's my own view. And I think it'll definitely extend health span because you will catch things while people are healthy not once they're ill, and then you take corrective action and keep them healthy. I, I think it'll totally ex extend health span. And the goal is to do that. You know, you want to have people live healthy, healthy life and then just die. That's how it should go. <laughs> That's, yes, my, my grandmother used to say that when I was younger and I thought it was morbid. And then now as I've gotten older, I'm like, nope. Nope, that's that's a good way to go. Like if you're just yeah, gonna go, I think go. So too. I you know, we all know cases where people say, well, at least they died, you know, <laughs> quickly or something where and we all know cases where somebody's hung on for three years in a lot of pain and very miserable fashion. Uh, and I don't again, at least my own personal view is that that's just that's certainly not what I want. And those probably should be personal decisions. But minimally, re regardless, everything we've been talking about should extend health span. 
catch th things while people are healthy, see these trajectories heading in a bad direction, and then take corrective action. And I think yep. that'll have the desired impact. So one, one final question before we go. Who do you think is drive is going to drive that? Is it going to be our the healthcare life sciences world, or is it going to be the technology world that's quickly encroaching? Because it's it's not Pfizer that's making this device mm -hmm. on my wrist, right? It's um, it's you know all the other companies you can name. Yeah, no, I I think it's gonna. Ideally, it would involve everybody partnering together, but you're right, technology is having a big impact because consumers are eager for this information as they often are. And especially as the word gets out and people like you and me start you know, espousing the wonders of and the power of this, these technologies. So I think there's that part. I do think we've got to get all the shareholders aligned, meaning I, th I think employers will should be a, a big incentivizers of this, meaning it pays for them to have their employees healthy. Uh, and that could be a plan they offer. If you're a big employer, maybe you have your folks enroll one of these, you know, prevented plans, hundred bucks a month, keep them healthy, save a lot of money. I do think it helps uh, to incentivize the users as well. I think people are often lazy uh, and unless, but they're, they're all concerned about their pocketbook and their loved ones. So I think the two ways to incentivize people are give them, you know, discounts on their insurance if they walk through 10,000 steps and you got to come up with ways for them not to cheat uh, or, or do various things. But um, I, I do think that'll help or you relay their family members to like egg them on a bit because Sometimes that's very incentivizing. So I think we need we need to have good incentive ways to do that. I I, I think financial incentives are better, better, one of the better ones. And again, that can relay back to the employer. The employer can offer these plans and then give people bonuses if they do do right. the things they're supposed to. Uh, you know, if you if you are overweight and lose weight, you, uh, you know, maybe that would. Well, you don't want people to get overweight and then lose weight, but you want to incentivize people to lose weight who are overweight. Anyway, you come up with the right models for incentivizing folks. So, so we need to get the financial models in place. We need to show the stuff works. Then the technology is going to keep improving, getting cheaper, et cetera. So it's all going to go together, I think, in parallel. And then people like you and me will be out there saying, man, this is amazing. Everybody should be doing this sort of stuff. I say it now, it's just tough to get everybody on board. So, yeah, yeah people are still yeah. scared. Yeah, but I, that'll go away. Hope so. I, I hope the physicians get less scared. That's my biggest hope. Yeah, we got to educate them. And th those folks, you have to show that it works, that it has power. And so it it's is great. That once they leave medical school, they're kind of, you know, out the gate. But they do have these refresher classes. They call them continuing medical education. And a lot of physicians do do that. And I think it's a great way. I give a lot of talks at those as a way to try to, I think, at least show the potential of what we're trying to do. And I think some of them buy it and some of them don't. Yeah. And, and you know, I think it needs to be integrated into their technological solutions to make it easier for them to sort of absorb it. And the current systems suck. That's true. Very true. Yeah. Yeah, they say, well, how do I have time to learn this and know if it's working? I'm too busy taking care of my patients. Yeah, your point's well taken. So great to speak to you. Um, I look forward to continuing to read all the stuff that you produce and all these amazing you know, technologies that, that you're, you're constantly, prolifically seem to be con putting out there. And um, I'll let you know when, the new, when, the, when my book is out. I, it, I definitely I, want to see it, please. Yeah. Excellent. Great. Great. Thank Talk you so much. You well, thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.